All right, let's talk about 4.1 exponential functions. So, what is an exponential function? Well, we've got a definition here. So, for any x that is just some real number, uh, an exponential function, it's just a function that looks like this. It's the function is some number, a, times the base, which is b, to the x. So we'll go through all this. A is a non-zero real number that we call the initial value. So this guy right here, A is a non-zero real number. It has to be non-zero. If it's equal to zero, then this whole thing's zero and it's not exponential. It's a constant function. In fact, it's the x-axis. I'll let you figure out what that means. B is a positive real number and B can't be one. So the base can't be one. And this is called the base. B is called the base. It's called the base, B-A-S-E. All right, the domain of this function, the domain of all exponential functions is all real numbers. And then the range of f, the range of an exponential function, it's all positive real numbers if a is bigger than zero, and it's all negative real numbers if a is less than zero. In addition, you have that the y-intercept is zero comma a, with a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. And you all have heard about things growing exponentially, or that got exponentially worse. You've heard this before, you've seen this sort of thing before, and we're going to learn that the graphs uh, of these things tend to look like uh, this. So they start off, they start off real slow and they grow real slowly until a certain point after which they take off. And exponential functions work so that instead of growing at some constant rate, they grow proportionally to how much they've grown already. So that is, instead of, think of it instead of adding over and over and over, uh, growing at a constant rate, you're multiplying over and over and over. Think about the difference between 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 and 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. The first is a linear sort of growth um, or some form of linear sort of growth or some form of growth less than exponential at least. And 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is literally 2 to the x. It's literally a exponential growth. Uh, your domain is always all real numbers. You can plug anything you want to into this guy right here. And then the range is just going to depend on what your A is. So if it's positive, then the range is all positive real numbers. If A is negative, that is there's a negative in front of out, out in front of everything, then the range is all negative numbers. Now notice that we didn't add or subtract anything out here. There was no D that we added or subtracted. So we haven't actually moved this whole thing yet. We'll get into that uh, in the next section. But for now, that's an exponential function. Your, your y-intercept is always 0, comma a. Obviously, if you plug in 0 to this function, b to the 0 for any b uh, is going to be uh, 1, and a, a times 1 will be a, so you get 0, comma a out. And they'll always have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. That is, there are no x-intercepts here. Notice I didn't say that there was an x-intercept because there aren't any. There's no number x you can plug in such that you get zero out for this. And if you want to try it, try it. Um, but let's look at this first example here. So let's look at this first example and then just a second one. Just a little thing to note. So the first example here says, of the functions 2x squared, the square root of x to the fifth plus one, four to the x and two to the negative x uh, which is an exponential function. And this is sort of a tricky way that I asked it, as if there were only one, but there's actually two in this one. So this is a monomial, or a polynomial in specific. This has the, the variable in the base. So that's not an exponential function. It is a power function, but it's not an exponential function. Uh, this, again, has the power in the base. This is x to the 5 over 2, if you want to write it a little bit differently. It's not an exponential function, but you'll notice here the x is in the power. The x is in the exponent. So 4 to the x is an exponential, and also 2 to the negative x. That's not 2 minus x. 2 to the negative x is also an exponential. Both of these have the powers up here in their exponent. So it has to have the power in the exponent, and it's an exponential function. That's easy enough. And then I want to talk real briefly about why b has to be equals greater than 0 and has to be not equal to 1 for an exponential function of that form. And let's just think for a moment about this, this case here. This is sort of a weird one. Why can't b, b be 1? Well, look here. If I graph f of x equals a, and then we just, let's just let b, b be 1. b, b 1, like that. Well, what is 1 raised to anything? 
1 times 1, 1 times itself, x times. 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times what? That'll always just be, no matter what that is, that will just be a times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times so on and so forth times 1. And it'll just do this, well, it'll just do this x times. Well, obviously, this is just 1, though. So this is just a. That is, this was just the function f of x equals a. That is, this was just a constant function. We want it to be an exponential function. This is just a constant. So that's why that case doesn't work. And then if b has to be greater than 0. Um, so we want b to be greater than 0 for this to work. Uh, so b can't be 0. Uh, if b is 0, obviously this whole thing's just 0. So see this argument again. What if b is less than 0? That's the last case. Let's just take some random number. Now, this is not a proof. This is not a proof, but let's just let's just take some random negative number. Let's take like negative two, so negative two in the base to the x power. So what are we talking about here when we say a times negative two to the x power? What is it exactly that we are talking about? Well, something that we would want to consider is well, this needs to happen for all x, right? This. This, this this thing that we're talking about here it needs to happen and work for every possible x that we can have. So what if, for instance, this were, say, I don't know, it has to work for all x, so it certainly has to work for one half, right? So let's just say that x is one half. It has to work for all of them. I'm going to show you that it fails for one half. So then this is a times, well, negative 2 to the one half, and raising anything to the one half power is just taking the square root. This is a times the square root of negative two. Now we're taking the square root of a negative. We want real numbers out. This isn't going to work. It has to work for all x. We found an x that doesn't work, so it isn't going to work in that instance. So again, this, this is more of a sketch of a proof than an actual proof, but this is the reason why b has to be greater than zero. If b is less than zero, then we're going to run into a situation where uh, we could have negatives under square roots and we will have uh, the domain not being all real numbers like we said it was. So b has to be greater than zero for us to have that nice property. All right, we move on. So let's talk about exponential growth and decay. A function that shows exponential growth grows by a rate that is proportional to the amount present like we were talking earlier. That is, for any x in R and any positive numbers a and b with b not equal to 1, again, we've talked about that, an exponential growth function has the form, oh, it's just a, it's just exponential function. It's just, that literally is what that is. f of x equals a times b to the x, where a, we call it in this case, the initial value of the function, and b, we call the growth factor uh, per unit x, whatever x is. So just let's look at an example and not think about that too much. Uh, an example should make it pretty obvious what we're talking about. It says that a culture of bacteria has an initial po uh, population of 29,000 bacteria and that it doubles every three hours. Using this formula, p sub t equals p sub 0 times 2 to the t over d, where p sub t is the initial population, t is the time in hours, and d is the doubling time, what is the population of bacteria in the culture after 19 hours to the nearest whole number? So this is a classic plug and chug formula, and this is of the form a times b to the x. a is whatever p, p naught is, p sub 0, p naught, it's the same thing, times 2, so 2 must be our base, and then t over d is our x, so x just looks a little different for us. So we want to use this, and we want to keep track of everything that we're talking about. So it gives us um, an initial population, an initial population. And remember that your initial value was a, and a is the thing in front of the thing being raised to a power. So a was that, so a was your p naught. So let's go through and put all this down. So we know that a must have been our p naught, uh, N-A-U-G-H-T naught. That's how they say it in uh, Canada and, and the United Kingdom. Uh, I like it better than p sub zero. So uh, that's usually just your initial value. Something sub zero is your, is your initial value. Uh, so we know what that is. Uh, we know what our b is uh, in this case. Our b was two. Um, and then we know what our t and our d is. Our t is the time in hours, and it gives it to us in hours. So that's nice. We don't have to... Uh, put anything together. So we know that our uh, that our t is 19 from the formula right there. And then we have uh, 
d is the doubling time. And so what we want to know from this is it doubles, look here, it doubles every three hours. So it must double every three hours, so our d must be three. So we're just going to plug everything in, and we want to know what is the population of bacteria to the nearest whole numbers. Well, p sub t uh, is... Um, uh, P sub T is what we're wanting to get out. Um, excuse me here for just a moment. That should have been a P naught. P naught is the initial population. Let's just plug everything in. So let's do uh, P naught, or P sub T rather, equals our P naught, which uh, we found was our A, which is our initial population, which is 29,000. So 29,000 times 2 to the, our T was 19, our doubling time was 3, and we're going to plug all this into uh, a calculator and figure this out because uh, we finally reached a part where uh, calculators are useful. So in application problems, it's completely fine to use them. In theory, we, we try not to. If you're trying to understand the theory behind what's working, uh, we don't like calculators as much for that. But when you've got giant numbers like this, yes, of course, you, you, you use a calculator for that. So after we've ran this through a calculator, we will get um, that our p sub t is run this through here um, and do this math real quick and we'll get that this is equal to um, 233-8413.4686 uh, which is about um, so let's see here that's 2,338,413.4686, and we want that to the nearest whole number, it says. So let's just, uh, that's less than 5, so cut that whole thing off. So it's just the uh, 233-8413 number is what we're looking for. All right, so that is uh, how many bacteria are in the jar. We start with 29,000. It has this model on it. Uh, after 19 hours, almost an entire day, it's went from 29,000 um, to just over 2 million. So bacteria does seem to double a lot, and you can see that that got out of hand very quickly. Um, but this is just the plug and chug. You just plug everything in, you take the number that you need, uh, and you run this through. Let's move on. You may also be asked to find an exponential from two points. So here's just an example of the sort of thing that you may be asked. It says write an exponential function in the form y equals a times b to the x that goes through the points 0 comma 7 and 4 comma 112. So uh, there is a method to doing this and I'm going to go ahead and show you the method. So the first thing that you're going to want to do here is uh, plug in this first point. So you've got a couple of points, and that's all the information that you need. So remember, you've got a point, and each one of these points is of the form x comma y. Don't ever lose track of that. That's very useful information that you've got there. So let's take our first x and y, such that we're going to take the point 0, 7, that is x equals 0 and y equals 7, and we're going to run it through this form. So our y was 7, so 7 equals a times b to the x was 0, so 0, and we're just going to solve this for a. So we know after plugging this in that anything to the 0th power is 1. That's something useful to remember. So 7 equals a times, well, b to the 0 is 1. Anything to the 0th power is 1. So then our a must be, let me write that a a little bit better, our a must be 7. So that's something useful to remember. And now, using this a, we're going to take this other point, 4 comma 112, that is x equals 4 and y equals 112, and we also now know that a equals 7. We're going to take all of this information and we're going to plug all of this into this same form again. So this time, our y is 112 equals, now we know what a is, 7 times our whatever b is, that's what we're going to solve for, to the x, which is fourth. And now we're going to solve this for b. So we're going to divide both sides by 7. So dividing both sides by 7, we get 112 divided by 7 is 16. 7 divided by 7 is 1. Okay, so we just divided both sides by 7. If you don't believe me, pick up a calculator, do 112 divided by 7. Uh, you'll get 16, so we get 16 equals b to the 4th, 
And in order to solve this, we're just going to take, well, we're either going to take the fourth root of both sides or we're going to raise both sides to the one fourth power. I prefer thinking of it um, as the latter. Um, so let me write this again like this. 16 equals b to the fourth. And now we're just going to raise both sides to the one fourth power. And 16 to the one fourth power is asking the question, what number do you multiply by itself four times to get 16? That is, we're taking the fourth root of 16, it's two. Two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16, that's four times. And then when you raise a power to a power, you multiply. So four times a fourth is one, that's b to the first power, which is b. So our b must be two. So what we wanted to do was write the exponential function in this form. So now let's write together, put together both of these pieces of information. Let's put together this piece of information and this piece of information uh, to see what's happening here. So it's going to be y equals whatever you found for a times whatever you found for b to the x. And that is your answer. That's what we're looking for. So to find the exponential for form in that uh, form that goes through a couple of points, you use one of the points to find a. You plug it in and you solve for a. And then you'll use the second point to find b. And then once you found a and b, you just plug them back into this form. There's a, there's b. And your, your answer should always look like this. Please do not try to multiply 7 times 2. Please take in mind, this is not 14 to the x. They are not the same thing. You cannot multiply these two numbers together. This is not raised to an x. So don't try doing that. It isn't going to work out the way you want it to. Uh, you've got some of these to work on, um, but this is how you do them. If you have more questions, hey, ask me when you get a chance. All right, I want to move on to defining e. Um, e will be a number for the rest of forever. But first, we need to talk about something that I can already, I can, I can see the moment you saw this, your head began to dim. You could feel the life leaving you as you saw in front of you the horror that is something from economics and personal finance. But this is where E comes from, is compound interest, and this is something useful. And people are always complaining, well, Mr. Bryant, you never teach those kids anything useful. And, you know, well, here you go. You can feel yourself falling asleep as I teach this. There's a reason I don't uh, particularly enjoy going over this, but... It's a useful formula, and it is where E comes from, and E, E's awesome. So hang in there. Let's hang in for one of these. But compound interest can be found using the formula. Uh, there's the formula. And in that formula, which is clearly a exponential formula, it's some constant times some base, that whole thing's the base, raised to some power. So NT is your X. 1 plus R over N is your B, and P is your A, if you want to know how this is an exponential formula. But A of T is the account value. T is the time measured in years. Please keep that in mind. P is the starting amount. That's called the principal. That's the amount that you start with in the bank or the present value. It's called the principal, though. Uh, R is the annual percentage rate. That's the APR expressed as a decimal. And N is the number of compounding periods in a year. So here's an example using that. And I'm just going to write down everything that we need to know, and then it's just going to be another plug and chug. And it says, if we invest in an investment account paying 2% interest, and let's just go ahead and do this. We need to express this as a decimal. So this is going to be 0 0.02. If we invest in an investment account paying 2% interest compounded quarterly, how much will the account be worth in 20 years? So we need to get all of this information. A of T is what we're trying to figure out. How much will it be worth? That's the account value. That's what we're trying to figure out. So we don't know what that is. So A of T equals, we don't know. We don't know what A of T is. Let's look at T. T equals time measured in years, it says. Time measured in years, right there. It says 20 years, so T must be 20. Now, if this were in months, we would need to convert it to years. I trust that you all know how to do that. P is the starting amount. Uh, if we invest in an investment account, uh, paying 2% interest, compounded quarterly. How much will the account be worth in 20 years? Um, how much did we invest? What was the dollar amount here? Well, the problem didn't give us one originally. So we could do this in general, uh, which, is what, uh, which is what we could do, and what I meant to do here. Um, but let's just say that we invested, let's just say that we invested $100. 
let's say that we if we invest a hundred dollars in an investment account paying two percent interest uh, just to make this math easier instead of getting uh, what we would do if we solved it without saying this is we would get a uh, amount in terms of p let's just say that if we invest a uh, hundred dollars in an investment account paying two percent interest compounded quarterly how will how much will the account be worth in 20 years so a hundred dollars so let's say that p is the starting amount so let's just say that that's a hundred dollars you could leave this as who knows as just question mark and what you would get is you would get a formula in terms of p and that is useful um, but I want to just do this as an example with just one thing in there. And then the last thing that you need to know is R and N. R is the annual percentage rate as a decimal, so it's 0 0.02, 0 0.02. Remember, always write that as a decimal. And then N is the number of compounded periods in a year. You're doing it quarterly. There are four quarters in a year, so N must be four. So we're going to use this information to solve so coming down to get a little bit more space, let's just plug everything in. So A of T must be, and just plug everything in. So uh, here's the formula up here, and we'll just plug everything in real easy. So it is P, which is 100, times 1 plus our rate, which was 0 0.02, over N, which was 4, the number of times we compounded, times, and then this part up here says N times T. So n times t is going to look like n, which was 4, times t, which is 20. So now we're just going to plug and chug and do some math here. So this is going to be 100 times uh, 1 plus 0 0.02 uh, divided by 4 um, to the 80 fifth power. 4 times 20 is 80. Uh, 0 0.02 divided by 4. G. what is that? That's 0 0.0, 0, 0, 0, 0 0.005. Uh, if you don't believe me, add this to itself four times. You'll get 0 0.01 and then 0 0.02. Yeah, so this whole thing is 100 times 1.005. Uh, to the 80th power. And if you uh, if you type that into a calculator, um, you'll come up with about 149.03. So it's about um, 149.0, the, the number is 149.03385, so on and so forth. So 0.33, um, 0 0.33, 033 rounds to 0 0.03. So $149.03 is how much it'll be worth. So you start with $100, you just leave it alone for 20 years, it earns that interest every three months, it'll be worth $149 by the end of that. And then that's just plug and chug, and that's what that worked. And I, I entreat you uh, to look at this and see what happens the more you compound. So change this number, try this again, the exact same problem, everything exactly the same, except instead of compounding quarterly, um, compound monthly. That is, make T12, and, and, and try, not T12, sorry, make N12, and keep increasing this value, 12, uh, 24, 3000, whatever, keep doing it, and see what happens to this number. So take some time. Pause the video and try this exact same problem again, except with n equals 12. And then try it again with n equals 120. And then n equals maybe 2,000, just some much larger number. And see what happens to this number down here. And as you change that, you will see a pattern. So pause the video and try that. So if you did, and I hope you did, that's, that's a big part of this, is, is learning on your own is you'll see that as n increases, so does this number, but only to a point. It only gets bigger to a point. Once you start increasing this n value between like a billion and a trillion, the difference is going to be less than a cent. It'll be a rounding error at that point. But obviously you want, if you're a banker, you want to make as much money as possible because this is just extra money that's in your pocket. You're making money almost out of nowhere. It's how the economy works. Uh, that is, no one understand how it works. So what happens then if we just let this n number be as big as we want it to be? Well, we've done that. Let's look at it. In fact, here's the definition of e.
So in the formula for compound interest, it was noted by early bankers that, some, that the more times an account was compounded a year, the more money was made off interest. Since maximizing this value was in their best interest, pun there, not intentional, they kept making the value in, which represents the number of compounding periods in a year, get larger. That is, they let n go to infinity with p equals 1, r equals 1, and t equals 1 for easy math. That is, you start with a dollar in the account, you have, get 100% interest, and this is, this is after one year how much is left in it. So, with a dollar starting, 100% interest, after one year, if you compound once, you get $2. You get a dollar back. That is, this is what this looks like. If you plug in the 1 out here for p, uh, the 1 for the r, and the 1 for the t that goes up here, all of that, you get this value out. So here's a table that shows you your end value that you plugged in and what you get out. If you do this with these constraints, if you do this with one, you get out two. If you do this 10 times, you compound 10 times in the year, and at the end of the year, that dollar has turned into $2.59. If you do it 100 times, the dollar has turned into $2.70. If you do it 1,000 times, you compound 1,000 times in a year, that is, you add the principal, you add the amount of interest back to the principal, and that becomes the new principal. That's what compounding means. It means that you take the amount of interest you've earned since the last time you've done this operation, you add it back to the principal, and that becomes the new principal. That's how you earn and accrue interest, which means the more money you have, the more money you make. Uh, if this ends a thousand times, you're doing this a thousand times a year, then you'll have $2.72 after rounding. And then 10,000 times 2.7181, you can see this number is getting closer and closer to this 2.718. So you can see that as our n gets really big, this is as our n goes to infinity, what's happening to our end of the year value for these easy numbers? Well, you can see that we're approaching some number. So at first, it jumps quite a bit. Uh, 59 cents is a lot uh, for just a dollar to, to earn extra just for doing it an extra nine times. But then we do it an extra 90 times between here and here, and the difference between these two isn't anywhere near as much. And then we do it an extra 900 times between here and here, and we barely get a penny out of it. And then we do it an extra... We do it an extra 9,000 times between here and here, and the difference is literally a rounding error. Like, anything past here doesn't even really matter much. Um, it's actually past here that we would care for, I suppose, if we're rounding for cents, but you get what I'm saying. So the more we compound, the less it matters in terms of this whole value here. But once we get here, this is what you get. And indeed, you can see, if you let n go on forever and keep getting larger and larger, this number um, zooms in. So what we're saying down here is, it seems as though as n goes to infinity, our formula just seems to be converging on a particular number. It happens so often in math, just like pi shows up all the time, that we give it a name. E. That is, E is the number. It's just a constant, like pi. Pi is 3.14159265.4, about. E is, the limit as x goes to infinity, and when I say x, I mean n, so limit as n goes to infinity, of 1 plus 1 over n to the n. That is, this thing, as n goes to infinity, this is just the fun calculus way of saying that, we get about 2.718. So the takeaway from this is this. E is a number, it's about 2.718. 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 E, that's a number, it's about 2.718. E, it's not a variable, it's a number, and it's about 2.718. Pi is a number, it's 3.14. E is a number, it's about 2.718. Anytime you see it, where does it come from? Voila, all of this stuff. So, what's that used for? You're going to regret asking me that, but we're going to go over it because you've probably already seen this formula before. So let's talk about the continuous growth and decay formula. So for all real numbers t and all positive numbers a and r, the continuous growth or decay is given by the formula a of t equals a times e to the rt. E, e is a number. It's about 2.718. It's a number. So this is the specific base. There's been other numbers here in the past. Now we're dealing with 2.718. This is the number that we care about. It shows up so often that we gave it a name. 
and it has lots of really cool properties that help us a ton in calculus and going forward. But for now, that's exponential stuff. So a times e to the rt. a is the initial value, r is continuous growth per unit time, and t is the elapsed time. If r is zero, it's growth. If r is less than zero, the formula is decay. All right, we've seen all that before. It's the exact same thing as before, except now our b value, our base, is just e. But that's continuous growth. So we don't have to worry about how, how often are you compounding. You are all the time, forever, doing the thing that you're wanting to do. And we'll talk about that right now. It says for business applications, continuous growth formula is called the continuous compounding formula. And it looks like this. So it says A of T equals P times E to the RT. You've seen, you've seen this. You've seen this perked guy before. P is the principal. T is the interest per unit time. And T is the period or term of investment. You've seen this before. You, you've seen this before. So it looks a lot more simple. And this gets rid of that N. If you look back at the previous formula that you had for this, this gets rid of the N. This is compounding continuously. That means how often are you taking the amount of interest you've earned and adding it back to the principal every waking moment of every day every sleeping moment of every day too. Every possible moment, you're accruing money. You're accruing money as fast as we possibly can. So using that, we're going to do this last example. So let's remember that our formula is A of T for continuous compounding, which is what we're given. A of T equals your principal times E, which is a number, which is 2.718, to the R, which is your rate, times your time, like that. Okay, so we're just going to need to figure out what all this is. I need to know what P is, I need to know what R is, and I need to know what T is. Like that. So let's figure out what all those are. Let's start with P. P, it's the amount that you started with, the principal. You start with $736. So let's keep that in mind. It earns an APR of 1.3%. So it's APR, the R is rate, and that's what we're looking for. That is this rate. So your APR is 1.3%. So then your R must be 1.3, right? No, it's per cent. Per cent, in case you weren't aware, literally means, let's break that down, per cent. As in cent, the Latin word for 100. This means per 100. What this literally means is 1.3 divided by 100. That's literally what we're talking about. That is move the decimal places over two points before you write what R is. So it's going to be 0 0.013. That's what R is. 0 0.013 is 1.3%. They're the same thing. And then it wants to know after two years. And T is still measured in years. So T is still measured in years. So there's P, there's R, there's T. So then A of T must be, just doing the math here, A of T is 736 times e, which is a number, which is 2.718, to the 0 0.013 times 2. Now, this is literally a transcendental number like pi raised to some ridiculous power multiplied by some ridiculous money. Of course, you have to use a calculator to do this. So if you slide this into a calculator, you will get more or less... Um, 755.3869, which is about, and it said to the nearest cent, so we're going to round two here, so we look at this, so 0.39. So this is about 755.39, and that's the amount. And if this were asked to you, this is what you would give it. I mean, it's dollars, but this is what we're typing in, 755.39. So that's rounded to the nearest cent. That's how much. So you start with $736 after two years at 1.3% interest, compounded continuously, you will have $755.39. Now, if I asked you at the end of this, not how much is in the account, but how much have you earned after two years, you didn't earn $755. You started with $736 already in there. How much did you earn? And I'm just going to go ahead and tack this on here so that I don't sidetrack you. But the amount earned is, of course, the amount at the end minus the amount that you started with. Okay, 
So try and keep this in mind. Of course, you would just do the math on that and get a number out of it. But if I ask you how much did you earn, there's one additional little step in there. And I trust that everybody uh, knows how to plug that into a, a calculator or just do some basic math in your head there. So this is everything that there is in 4.1. Uh, go ahead and go work on this. Uh, and we'll hop over to 4.2 soon. If you have any questions, uh, be sure to ask me in class. Thanks.